Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm happy today to have uh, Dr. Pat Skinner as our seminar speaker. Um, Pat comes to us from the newly named CIRO, uh, formerly SIMS, which is associated with the University of Oklahoma. That's the Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations, uh, which also works alongside the National Severe Storms Lab in Norman, Oklahoma. So before that, uh, Pat got his PhD at Texas Tech, the wind science and engineering program there, and um, eventually made his way to NSSL, National Severe Storms Lab, as a postdoc. We were both NRC postdocs. We overlapped for a year there where we got to uh, collaborate on a few things and then went our separate ways. Um, and Pat has uh, stuck around in Oklahoma and is now a research scientist, excuse me, a research scientist too at CIRO and the team lead uh, for the forecast applications and social science team at the National Severe Storms Lab. So Pat's um, expertise lies in severe convection uh, a lot of supercell and tornado genesis work, uh, but recently has spent his time working on the worn on forecast program at NSSL, which has to be entering its second decade now almost, um, which is a, a program designed to kind of change the paradigm of how severe storm warnings are issued using short term um, modeling forecasts. And so Pat has a number of publications, collaborative publications um, based on that work. So um, today his talk is entitled, entitled The Evolution and Predictability of the 10 August 2020 Midwest Derecho. And so um, Pat, welcome, thanks for being here and um, hopefully you can share your screen and take it away. All right, thank you, Michael, for the introduction and also the invitation. And can everyone see my screen? And hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, I can't see anybody else right now. Um, okay, yeah, thank you for the, the invitation. And as you mentioned, today I'm gonna talk about a pretty exceptional event that occurred last summer. And um, as you'll notice, I have a, an enormous number of people in the acknowledgments uh, on the title slide here, and I just want to mention that this uh, project grew out of just a, a really, really long email chain that happened after the event where you had uh, a particularly intense and high impact derecho that was also a surprise. It was, it was not well anticipated in advance, and so what happened was uh, several of us in NSSL and Ciro, who work on the Warner Forecast Project, uh, began emailing back and forth with forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center. And what ended up uh, happening out of this email thread was we designed an experiment to try to look at how this, this event could be predicted with the Warner Forecast System. And uh, I'm gonna talk about some aspects of that today. So to begin with, um, I, I guess I've kind of given away the result with the title of the talk, but I thought it would be interesting to sort of try to put ourselves in the shoes of SBC forecasters on the night preceding the direct show. Um, and so I'm not gonna do a, a formal or really in-depth analysis, but just wanna look at a couple of different um, pieces of, of numerical weather prediction guidance and also some observations, just to look at some of the key features uh, that influence the evolution of the event. And so to begin with, this is just a WPC surface analysis valid at 03 UTC. And so you're looking at about eight hours before the storms that uh, eventually became the derecho developed and intensified. And you can see that you have a cold front that's uh, draped from uh, you know northern Minnesota and then across far southeastern South Dakota and into central Nebraska. And that's going to be the primary surface feature um, for the day. And because this is uh, late August, you can see that you have uh, copious moisture in the central plains um, and certainly, you know, in Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, lots of cornfields. So you have uh, really a lot of moisture and potential instability to work with. I don't show the Cape field, but at this point at zero TZ, it's, it's over four or 5,000 
in the warm sector there. And looking at just the 500 millibar uh, meso analysis from Storm Prediction Center, also valid at O3GC. Um, looking at the, the heights and the ice attacks, you can see that there is a shortwave trough that's sort of uh, rounding through central Montana at this time. And you do have a, a kind of region of moderate mid-level winds out ahead of it that are over South Dakota, Minnesota from 40 to 60 knots. And so, uh, you know, this is not an uncommon summertime setup you have. Um, generally weak, weak forcing, you don't have any really dominant synoptic features, it's not a very amplified pattern, uh, but there is certainly a lot of potential instability to work with, and so this is something that I'd characterize as a generally uh, kind of weakly predictable environment where there's a lot of uncertainty as to the evolution. And to look at some, how that uncertainty manifests, I was going to look at uh, convection allowing model guidance, and in this case, convection allowing models have become uh, an indispensable tool for short-term thunderstorm prediction uh, anywhere, but in particular at the Storm Prediction Center. Uh, and this is simply numerical weather prediction models that are run with uh, sufficient resolution uh, so that you do not need to parameterize convection. So we're going to be looking at a lot of models that are run with three kilometer horizontal grid spacing, uh, which is, is not ideal, but is sufficient to resolve individual thunderstorms. And the standard for using these uh, CAM models has been the High Resolution Ensemble Forecaster ATREF. And in numerous studies, um, there's one by Brett Roberts that came out last year that compare it to other convection allowing ensemble forecasts. Uh, we found that the probabilistic forecasts from the ATREF have been superior to other ensembles. And one aspect to that is that the ATREF is made up of multiple different deterministic models. It's an ensemble of opportunity instead of one that's initialized for a single dynamic core and, you know, suite of parameterizations. Um, and we found that that's generally provided uh, improved spread over single core, single physics systems, and that's helped translate it into better probabilistic forecasts. So this is this is what SBC forecasters would have been looking at uh, as they created an outlook that would have been due at 6 UTC on August 10th. And I just want to look at the ensemble mean CAPE field first. And I'm just going to loop through that from hours 01 to 13 UTC to see how uh, the potential instability evolves. You can see uh, certainly there's there's strong instability out ahead of the cold front in uh, southeast South Dakota and Nebraska. But as you go through the night, as typically happens overnight, uh, that instability uh, decreases, you know, with stabilization over nocturnal stabilization. And by the next morning at nine, nine in the morning central time, uh, you can see that there's still a fair amount of surface based Cape, but most of it is, um, you know, into southern Iowa, uh, southern Nebraska, and sagging southward into sort of the central Great Plains. And that's uh, associated with the motion of the, the front. Similarly, you can use the CAM guidance to look at explicit prediction of thunderstorms. And so this is something we call a paintball plot. And all we're doing is shading. Any ensemble member where reflectivity is greater than 40 dBZ over the period from 1 to 13 UTC. And if you look at the bottom, uh, you can see the different members that make up the HREF uh, that were during the summer of 2020. And uh, these minus 6 hour, minus 12 hour forecasts, that indicates a time lag. And then you also have 0Z runs of the high resolution rapid refresh. And then uh, WERF models run by NSSL uh, with two variations of that, and then also the NAM nest. And each one gets its own color, and you can see where the storms in each member evolve uh, over the course of these 12 hours. And so I was going to point out that, you know, initially you have uh, convection along the dry line into the southern plains. That decays overnight, but most members develop uh, convection in the area of maximum cape ahead of the cold front uh, through South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa. And if you look at it, most members have some semblance of thunderstorms there. However, the size of those thunderstorms, the evolution of those thunderstorms, and if you look closely, you can see some things that kind of resemble bow echo type features or uh, more organized MCS type features. Uh, there's a lot of variability from member to member there. And so that's something that I, I think it's important to take away here is that they're all predicting something to happen overnight uh, in South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, but there's almost no consensus between the eight members as to what is going to happen. And finally, you can also use the CAMs to uh, provide ex uh, explicit guidance of different thunderstorm hazards. So this is now looking at 
damaging wind potential within each of those uh, members for the same time period. And this is now the uh, contours are four hour neighborhood probability of wind greater than 30 knots. And so damaging winds, uh, as would be reported to the Storm Prediction Center, are over 50 knots, but three kilometer grid spacing is insufficient to resolve the kind of gusts that produce that magnitude. So uh, it's sort of an ad hoc way of, of providing a proxy for damaging wind potential when you look at just strong gusts over 30 knots. And then you can see uh, the paintballs in this case represent the footprint in each member of wind exceeding 30 knots and also uh, reflectivity exceeding 20 dBz. So this is going to be convective wind that we're looking at. And um, you see basically the same picture. Most members, or at least a large proportion of the members, you can see there's some contours of over 50% here in eastern Nebraska overnight, uh, predict potential for strong winds uh, overnight in Nebraska and into Iowa. However, as you get towards the morning time, you notice that the, uh, both the probability and also the aerial footprint of those members uh, is decreasing. So it seems to be pointing to something that's kind of an uncertain and probably not a very intense event where it's not maintained throughout the entire evening. And you aren't seeing, you know, anything that really looks like a coherent swath. Also, it's kind of a, a splotchy swath of higher winds. Um, so that's looking at it overnight. And now I'm just going to briefly jump through that for the second portion of the forecast period. So now we're looking at the day of August 10th and looking at Cape first. You can see that, you know, as, as you get surface heating, you get a maximum in surface base Cape ahead of the front. And that now extends through Kansas, Missouri and Illinois. Uh, in terms of reflectivity, um, Notice that most of the reflectivity associated with the nocturnal convection uh, decays with one exception, and that's this, this brown paintball here that does look like it develops something like a bow echo through uh, Iowa and Illinois. And that's associated with the zero Z high resolution rapid refresh run. And we'll talk about more about that later. But what really jumps out is that you get much more widespread convective development in most of the members along the front, along the dry line in the late afternoon in Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. And so taking all of this information in, SBC issues, oh, excuse me, I forgot, the, the wind forecast as well, which tells basically the same story. And again, I'd like to note that, you know, you have a much more coherent swath of damaging winds in the HER through Iowa than any other member. So it is an outlier solution of the eight members in this case. Uh, however, most of them are producing uh, damaging wind potential through Kansas, Missouri. And uh, finally, you could actually post-process these wind fields into something that corresponds apples to apples to the probabilities issued by the Storm Prediction Center. And what you get with a 24-hour forecast from 12Z on August 10th to 12Z on August 11th is low probabilities of damaging winds, but non-zero and generally associated with the convection ahead of the front in Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. You'll notice that it's it's below two percent, so basically as low as you can get through western Iowa and generally two to five percent in central Iowa. And so taking all that information in, you end up with a, a day one convective outlook from the Storm Prediction Center that matches the expectations from the HRF guidance and then also seems to match the uh, what available observations there were at 6 UTC. And so they have a slight risk of thunderstorms uh, generally in the area of the maximum cape and the maximum thunderstorm coverage. And, uh, you know, 15% likelihood of damaging wind potential there. And so a slight risk. It's, it's something that happens nearly every day in the summer. Nothing that's out of the ordinary. Um, they do note in the weather uh, convective outlook discussion here that the main issue with this forecast is the difference in model solutions. So they do note that there was uh, an unusually large amount of spread in the different CAM solutions. And that it contributed to greater than normal forecast uncertainty, uh, especially considering the distribution of instability. And we'll look at that later. So you're left with, you know, uh, an uncertain forecast, but it generally points to something that the maximum potential is down across Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. And so now we're going to look at what happened. And this is a very long uh, MRMS composite reflectivity loop. Uh, so 19 hours from 3 UTC on the 10th of August through 22 UTC on the 10th of August. And I've overlaid uh, local storm reports to the Storm Prediction Center. So anything in blue is a severe wind report. Anything in red is a tornado. Anything in green is a severe hail report. Um, in all, over this uh, period, 
period of this event, there's over 600 damaging wind reports associated with this MCS that develops in Southeast South Dakota and moves across Iowa into Illinois and Indiana. Over 50 of those are significant wind reports, which indicates uh, wind speeds greater than 65 knots and 27 tornado reports. And so this is a quote from Jeremy Grams, uh, who was working the day shift that day at SBC. And he just noted that this event was a surprise. It was that morning, I didn't imagine this was going to be the most intense derecho I've worked in my 15 years at SBC. So it's a surprise, not only that a organized convect mesoscale convective system developed uh, based on the available guidance uh, the night before, but it was unusually intense. This is, is one of the most severe derechos that has occurred in the past multiple decades. And to show uh, some, some uh, evidence of that, this is just a graphic put together by the Weather Service. Um, the estimated peak wind gusts across central Iowa. And anything shaded here is a severe wind gust. And as you can see, as you get into these green colors, you get 100 mile an hour winds uh, out of a convective storm. And especially in the Cedar Rapids area, this swath is green and then into the 120 mile per hour plus uh, estimated winds in Cedar Rapids is associated with um, kind of a bookend vortex that developed on the north end of the Bow Echo. And what ended up happening is there's multiple embedded uh, mesovortices within that. And they trained over the same period over a reasonably long period of time. So in some cases, um, Damaging winds were maintained for over 40, 45 minutes in the system. And that is really uncommon for uh, a damaging mesoscale convective system. So it really is an unusually intense event that was also not very well anticipated. So this is becomes a very interesting event to look at from a research perspective then, of course. And in terms of impacts, um, unfortunately, there are four fatalities. 1.9 million people lost power, some of which up to two weeks. Um, and it's estimated to have caused $11.7 billion in damages. This is the, the single cost, costliest single thunderstorm event in U.S. history. So obviously you, you, you have those two things that are working to make this, you know, a particularly interesting event to, to research because this is as high impact event as you can get for thunderstorms uh, over decades. And similarly, it was not very well predicted compared to uh, something like a tornado operator that you might be able to anticipate two, three days in advance with, with some measure of confidence, at least on a regional scale. And uh, just to show the, the, the extent of the damage to Iowa's cropland, this is two um, synthetic aperture radar RGB composites uh, taken before and after the derecho. And you can see any of these uh, brighter green colors or even brown, which indicates scouring in Iowa on the area of the highest winds that you just have you know, Iowa, which is almost all cropland and widespread damage to that um, during the event. OK, so one last thing that I'd like to mention um, before we get into some of the uh, simulations and analyses of the event is that the Storm Prediction Center did recognize that the initial forecast was not on track to verify early. So as observations developed overnight, they begin to include stronger language about the potential for damaging winds. And then by the time they issued a 13 UTC, the next day one outlook after the one we looked at earlier, they've upgraded uh, areas of Western Iowa from general thunderstorm into a slight risk, and also areas of Illinois from a marginal to an enhanced risk. And so this is something that is very rarely done at SBC. Typically, they do not change the outlook scale by more than one degree. So they'll go from a marginal to a slight or a slight to enhanced but you don't jump from a marginal to an enhanced. And then three and a half hours later, as the derecho had become basically evident and they're beginning to use the language of a derecho in the discussion, they've upgraded it further to a moderate. So, you know, for some areas of, of West Central Iowa, you're going from an initial day one outlook of almost general thunderstorms to a moderate risk. And that's something that's almost unheard of in terms of a modification of event from SBC. So, that leads to the, the main science questions here, which is first off is, you know, you did not get very useful CAM ensemble guidance of this event. And granted, it's, it's probably a difficult forecast and probably a low probability, high impact type event, but why did most of the CAMs fail to have any uh, prediction or any signal for this potential of direct development? And then secondly, because this is such a high impact event, 
uh, would additional conventional allowing ensemble guidance uh, or, or different kinds of conventional allowing ensemble guidance have been able to improve the anticipation of the ratio potential. So even if we accept that this is a low um, likelihood event and it's a, a difficult prediction to make, uh, how quickly this developed could mean the difference between having two to three additional hours of anticipation for people in Western and Central Iowa that this is going to be not only a damaging wind event that was uh, unexpected the day before, but also a, a particularly severe one. So what we'd be interested in is, are we able to provide any kind of useful guidance that could have improved the anticipation of this event beforehand? And uh, before I get into uh, some of the different simulations, I wanted to step through this radar evolution one more time, just to highlight some different features that are of relevance uh, later on. So to begin with, uh, I've highlighted in sort of this purple-ish box, uh, storms that develop along the cold front in Northeast Nebraska between three and nine UTC. And you'd see that they are generally short-lived, not terribly intense uh, multi-cell type storms. And so that's the first area of interest. And then the second one occurs between seven and 11 UTC right now. And you have a pretty widespread development of elevated multicellular convection along the Nebraska South Dakota border. And that convection, I'll step through. Sorry about that. I'll just start it over. Um, oh my, sorry about that. Okay. Stepping through, that grows upscale into the MCS through Nebraska into Western Iowa between 11 and 13 UTC and then becomes surface-based and turns into the progressive uh, damaging derecho uh, after 13 C. So the two things that we're really going to focus on in terms of predictability, though, is going to be the evolution of this multicellular convection along the cold front early in the evening, and then also the development of the elevated multicell convection along the South Dakota North Nebraska border. And how we're going to look at it, and as, as you probably would have guessed from my introduction, is using the Warn on Forecast system. And this is a very brief description of uh, the Warn on Forecast system. I'd refer you to uh, Jones et al. 2020 for sort of a recent description of the operational, semi-operational configuration that we use. But in essence, it's an on-demand, short-term ensemble analysis and prediction system. And it's been designed to provide hazards, guidance on hazards within individual convective storms. And what we mean by that is that we're going to use rapidly cycled assimilation of radar and satellite data to try to analyze individual convective storms within our ensemble. And the idea is basically if we're able to create an accurate storm scale ensemble or analysis, then you'll be able to create an accurate prediction of individual thunderstorms for something on the order of three to six hours in advance. Um, and so we're going to use WASP for something that's a bit out of what it's designed to do here because we're going to look at much longer lead times than normal. But the idea is originally if we're able to use this rapidly cycled assimilation of radar data during the early evening and during the development of those multi-cells along the cold front and then also the elevated storms in uh, South Dakota, is WASP able to latch on to the eventual solution uh, of a derecho earlier than would have been available from other convection allowing models? And so we do this by initializing WASP using the uh, 0, 01 UTC high resolution rapid refresh ensemble. And I put that in bold because that's going to be important later on. And we issue 18 different WAFs forecasts hourly between 3 UTC and 20 UTC. We run each forecast out to 22 UTC. So for this early forecast, we're running much longer than we normally are. We also run it over a much larger domain than we normally run WAFs in order to get the full evolution of the system inside of it. So we normally run up on a 900 by 900 kilometer domain. Uh, and so we've extended that to 1600 by 1200 here. And each forecast contains 18 different ensemble members. So we have lots of different members to look at and to generate probabilistic forecasts of the event. So I'm going to show uh, WASP forecast initialized at 03 UTC here in this loop, and it's going to be the ensemble 90th percentile value of maximum wind gust. And uh, we use the 90th percentile uh, similar to how it's used for snowfall or storm surge. It's to provide a basically reasonable worst case scenario. So, you know, something where you use the ensemble max, especially with 18 members, you get a lot of outlier solutions that are included and you get a broader field. And so this constrains that a little bit to be where at least two or three members are predicting uh, values of these wind speeds. 
And in the color table, you can see anything shaded orange is going to correspond to severe wind as defined by the National Weather Service. And anything in red is going to be significantly severe wind. So wind gusts over 65 knots. OK, and the gray shading and contours here indicate the location of predicted storms in the ensemble at any given moment. And the dots indicate local storm reports. As you can see, um, you go forward and this is a 19 hour forecast and it's plotted with output frequency every five minutes. So you get uh, a lot more temporal information than you typically get from a convection allowing model. Uh, you can see that WAFS predicts the evolution of the event uh, pretty well. And in our case, much, much better than we initially expected it to. Um, we thought that it would improve prediction after storms had developed and it was able to assimilate different radar observations. Uh, and to, so to see it do this well early on was a surprise. However, you can see it does predict a progressive derecho across Iowa and Illinois. Uh, it is generally predicting wind speeds that are similar to those observed, where you have a really broad swath of wind along the northern uh, extent of the bow echo that's exceeding 80 knots up to 90 knots or higher. And you also see that it is not perfect. It is shifted north uh, relative to the location of the highest density of wind reports uh, from the actual event. So it, it's certainly not perfect, but you know we were very surprised at, in thinking that, well, this is a really good forecast. And so we wanted to look at why that may be and what, some, what are some aspects of this that it did particularly well with. And so I'm gonna show another loop here. Um, and so this is going to have uh, Paintballs and gray shading, which is every WAFS member of uh, predicting a thunderstorm at any given time. You're going to have the LSRs on there again. And then the light shading in the under and is the most unstable cape. And the green contours um, represent 700 millibar convergence. And so you have this area of uh, 700 millibar convergence uh, around 9 UTC and elevated instability, and that corresponds to the elevated convection develops around Nebraska and South Dakota border. And so WASP did a really good job of predicting that. Uh, the other thing to notice is that it does have some storms in uh, Nebraska along that front, but not many. And so that's also gonna be important to look at going forward. And there's also a, a northward bias in the location of this elevated CI relative to observations. And because it grows upscale in a similar manner, that leads to the northward bias in the WASP prediction of the highest winds. But in general, it gets the evolution of the event pretty close. It's, it's a good forecast. And the other thing that I thought was neat about this is to look at the transition of elevated storms and an elevated MCS into a surface-based progressive derecho. And WASP does a nice job of look, uh, locating the location of the front during the day. You can see this is now looking at surface-based capes, so you're not looking at the elevated storms. And you see that as WASP is able, forecasts are able to tap into that surface-based cape, you get an acceleration of the reflectivity paintballs. And then that also corresponds with sort of the increase in the frequency and density of wind reports. So it seems to be capturing the transition from an elevated base system to one that is producing widespread damaging winds at the surface. And that's really important information for forecasters. So, so in general, we were very happy with this and very surprised, but it didn't leave us with as much to examine as we thought, because our initial expectation was that these forecasts will be initially bad and we'll see them get better as you assimilate radar data. But we still want to check that. So we want to look at how does the radar data assimilation influence these WASP forecasts with time. And so I'm going to just step through now on the left, uh, composite reflectivity valid at the initialization time of a WASP forecast. And so at 3 c you see you have basically no storms in South Dakota, Nebraska. Uh, and you do get this high probability of damaging winds. And so this is now not the maximum wind intensity, but the wind likelihood. So this is just ensemble neighborhood probability of a wind gust over 50 knots. Um, and so you get a, a really good forecast, but it is displaced north relative to the highest density of the observations. And in subsequent forecasts, this is now the five UTC MRMS and WAFs, you get very similar pictures. Um, very, very highly confident prediction of damaging wind event. Um, however, it's displaced north relative to the observations. And that goes all the way through 7 UTC. You can see that uh, these, these weaker storms that develop in Nebraska don't seem to be influencing WASP forecast too much. However, as you get CI in South Dakota, 
you know, toggle back and forth, you see a noticeable shift southward in WAFs. And what's happening there is WAFs is able to assimilate the, uh, the storms in radar that the elevated storms in radar that's felt in South Dakota. And that's able to give it a better analysis of the elevated storms. And then that translates into a better prediction of the path of the eventual derecho. And by 12 or 11 UTC, it's become even better, where at this point, WAS is able to analyze the uh, sort of incipient derecho and very accurately predict its uh, track through Iowa and Illinois with a great deal of confidence. So that was something that was, it was promising because that was the kind of thing that we were intending to measure is that we should be able to see WAFs respond to developments in the environment in terms of radar and satellite data and hopefully improve its guidance with time. So that's the first question. And then the second we wanna look at is, so it, we've established that WAFs and also HERS, it turns out, do a pretty good job with this event. So why did the other models not do a good job? And for that, it ended up being pretty straightforward. So I'm showing now again in the upper left corner uh, the MRMS composite reflectivity and then associated predictions from three different members of the HRF. Um, I have the HER in the upper right and then the NAM nest and the Nisselwerf uh, on the bottom row. However, the other HRF members are all very similar to the Nisselwerf and the NAM nest. And you can see that they both have more widespread convection in uh, Nebraska ahead of the front. At 3 UTC, uh, certainly than observations where there is none, and also in the HER, where there is a couple of spurious storms, but they seem to be uh, smaller in scale. And as you step forward four hours, um, those storms have grown upscale in both the Nisselwerf and the NAM nest, and that is obviously not reflected in observations. And the HER has grown them upscale a little bit and moved the storm into Iowa, but it's a uh, much smaller uh, in terms of aerial coverage. And so this, this corresponds with the time that SBC began noticing, well, these models are not doing well relative to observations and that there's a lot more potential for a damaging wind event than we previously realized and began updating their forecast. So they recognized this as it was happening. And going forward to 11 UTC, as those elevated storms begin to develop, uh, you can see that you now still have, in the case of the, the NSSL wharf, uh, kind of a weak MCS that's moved all the way across Iowa. You have just scattered, convection in the name nest and the her though most of the convection in ahead of the front in Iowa has died and that makes a big difference as you might imagine in terms of the cold pool coverage associated with those storms and the potential uh, most unstable cape at 11 UTC so we're looking at the same thing now there's MRMS reflectivity in the upper left and then you have cape across Iowa and the NSSL wharf is gone there's there's no cape surface based or elevated across all of Western Iowa. So you may have the storms in the Nissel Wharf developing um, along the South Dakota and Nebraska border, but they just don't have any instability to maintain them. And you see sort of an intermediate scenario in the NAM nest where you have some instability there, but you also have this, this sort of break in instability across Iowa. And you have a much more pristine inflow environment to a, a progressive derecho in the HER, where you still are maintaining a very high, over 3000 kilos per kilogram uh, MU cape across all of Iowa and ahead of those developing elevated thunderstorms. So in this case, that's that's basically the smoking gun as to why most CAMs failed at this, is they overpredicted the amount of convection along the front. In Nebraska overnight, those produced cold pools and that wiped out the, the, the environment that the derecho eventually grew into. So something that's particularly important here is that this is a failure in the forecast in the first six hours. Um, and so all of these models basically had a forecast go awry in the first six hours. And you can see the feedback from those initial errors in the subsequent uh, or in later periods. Okay, and, and just as, as a capper to that, to show here's the composite reflectivity at 1700 as the derecho is ongoing. You see the HER has a remarkably good forecast at this point, um, but when you looked at it relative to all the other HRF members, it was the only one that had that forecast. So it was hard to put a lot of stock in that signal. It looked like an outlier because it was it was very different than what the other members predicted. And in this case, the Nisselwerf and the NAM nest have almost no thunderstorms over Iowa, when in reality, there's, there's an extremely intense derecho that's ongoing. So to summarize some of the, the findings of, of how the CAMS handled this, is that the um, anticipation of a very high end derecho was limited by inconsistent uh, 
prior day convection allowing model guidance. And a lot of that inconsistency is driven by how well these models uh, predicted evolution of the nocturnal convection. And in fairness, that's, that's an enormously difficult problem and it's known to be a difficult problem, particularly during the summer and weekly force events. And so this is just a situation that is a, a difficult one for CAMS to produce an accurate forecast. And it makes these kinds of events more difficult to forecast in general, but that doesn't mean we can't improve the way that we predict them. And uh, the models that predicted short-lived storms, uh, which was basically the HER and the WAFs, which was initialized from the HER, produced accurate forecasts of the ratio. And the other models, they predicted a lot more development along the cold front and upscale growth. Uh, they basically produced cold pools across Iowa and missed the ratio forecast entirely. And uh, finally, from the WAF standpoint, we did see that rapidly cycled assimilation of radar and satellite observations allowed WAFs to correct initial uh, track errors in the derecho. And, and as just a general takeaway here, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, obviously. Um, there is evidence that a frequently updating CAM and CAM Ensemble could improve anticipation of events like this. If nothing else, it gives you a chance to catch up to initial errors in your forecast uh, and analysis, especially if you're using rapidly cycled data simulation. So uh, with that, I just wanted to go through a couple of things that we're still uh, researching. So this is an ongoing project. So this is the, the direction that we're going right now. And one is just uh, is, is some kind of general speculation on uh, the ways that we use CAM ensemble guidance to predict thunderstorms. And so we're issuing probabilistic forecasts here. So, so the question of whether or not WAFs or HREF is better for this case is, is we just don't know the answer. Um, it could have been a very low likelihood event that just happened to occur. So HRF could have gotten that probability right, and so could WAFs. So we just don't know until we get a lot of different cases, and that's not going to happen considering the intensity of this event for quite some time. Uh, but we can use that to inform how we interpret different CAM guidance products. And so, you know, from what we know from past verification studies is that HRF tends to outperform other CAM ensembles because it is more reliable in its probabilities. It's got greater ensemble spread. And a single model ensemble like WAFs is typically overconfident. And if you look at it, you know, it, it makes for a pretty picture to have these 90% probabilities in a 17 hour forecast all the way across Iowa and Illinois. But realistically, you would know that there's a lot more uncertainty than that. So you can tell that it's, it's overconfident in this forecast. Um, and even though it's overconfident, it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of ensemble spread in WAFs. This is now all 18 members, just the reflectivity and the gray shading corresponds to updraft velocity tracks, valid at 18 UTC. Uh, so this is a 15 minute uh, hour forecast and you can look at the instantaneous reflectivity of each 18 member. And you can see that there's a lot of variation in the size, uh, structure and location of the MCS in each different WASP member. But every single WASP member has a progressive bow echo across Iowa. And so in this case, we can see that it's providing maybe useful spread in terms of the storm scale, where if you know what the overarching storm mode is going to be, this could be very useful information. But if it's before convection initiation, and there's a lot of uncertainty into the general location and even mode of uh, convective storms, then it's something that's likely overconfident. And so this is something that I think points to differences in the way you would interpret something like WAFs or HER that are rapidly updating. You have forecasts available every hour and other CAMs that may share a lot of the same configuration that are run once or twice a day. And that's something like, like most of the HREF models where you have kind of the next day pre-CI problem. And for that, maybe you want to look at the HREF. But then as an event uh, initiates and becomes ongoing, then you start to see systems like WAFs or HER distinguish themselves from some of the next day ensembles and be able to provide guidance that the others cannot. And in terms of more future work, these are, this is just a wish list of places that we're going with this. Um, certainly want to do some more analyses of the different HRF members, you know, look at soundings, environments, and maybe even how that relates to different physical parameterizations uh, that made it more likely for them to uh, over predict the storms along the front. One thing I'm particularly interested in is some of those members are cold start. They do not include any radar data simulation. And because of that, they may have had uh, an overprediction in CAPE and an underprediction in SIN in the initial conditions. So 
basically created an environment that was more friendly for convective development than reality. And we want to work with SBC forecasters. We want to take the WASP guidance back to SBC forecasters and learn from them how they could have incorporated into their workflow and how that may have altered the forecast for this event. And then finally, we want to perform quantitative verification of forecasts. Uh, I've used a lot of object-based verification for WASP forecasts in the past, and we want to try to do that to, to verify embedded features within the BOE echo. And that's something that gets more at not the damaging wind potential, but the mesovortex and tornado potential that developed into Illinois with the system. And this is an example on the right of a very first pass of doing that. You can see it needs a lot of work, but anything that's highlighted there would indicate a portion of the uh, convective line that's associated with the mesovortex. So that's the kind of direction we're trying to take this in the future. And if anyone's interested in looking at the output from this, uh, in any other WASP cases, we do have an archive up at wasp.nssl.noaa.gov, and please feel free to email me if you have any questions at patrick.skinner.noaa.gov, and I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Pat, thank you. Um, so if anybody has uh, questions, you can put them in the chat, and I can read them, or you can just um, raise your hand. Um, I can start off with a question or two. Um, so I was wondering if, if these results at that time scale argue for um, ensembles with more ensemble members, uh, with the idea that at least forecasters could tune into the idea that, well, okay, if we don't have this overnight preceding convection and that instability is still there, that that uh, this could be a conditional threat? Um, or uh, are there other possibilities that you see that could, could mitigate or improve forecasting of this type of event, of a, event in the future? Uh, but yes, I think it's a strong argument for, for larger ensembles. Uh, one thing that we've had multiple studies on is, is you look at the relative trade-off in computational cost versus forecast skill improvement between a larger ensemble and higher resolution, smaller ensemble. And you, you do see benefits to running at higher resolution. And so in, I think a lot of those benefits are things that we haven't identified properly yet. But in general, you get a better forecast running an ensemble and then a larger ensemble at three kilometer grid spacing than you do running a smaller one or deterministic model at one kilometer grid spacing. And in terms of running a larger ensemble, you can look at bulk statistics and say that, you know, you're maybe not gaining much um, as you go much above maybe 10 members. Uh, and, but obviously, you know, the point of the ensemble is to, to represent the uncertainty of the environment. So the larger, the better. And in cases like this, that's where you see, you know, what may not be reflected even 95% of the time for different forecasts. If it's reflected in a high impact events like this, then it makes it very much worth the cost. And that's something that I, I don't know a good way to assess because it's such a rare event. But that's something that I think is, is certainly worth considering, where if the HRF had three times as many members and there were maybe four or five members that showed the potential for a derecho in Illinois, it would help it stand out from all of the other ones because you basically had no overlap between members when you run only with eight. Um, okay, uh, ming -Wah, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, hi, Pat. A very interesting talk. So uh, do all members uh, assimilate radar refractivity? Yes. In the WAFs, we assimilate uh, radar reflectivity and then also GO-16 cloud water path and um, water vapor uh, clear sky radiances uh, every 15 minutes. And we do that with every member using an ensemble column filter. Uh, so for the 18 member, not as a WAF, all the uh, member also use uh, uh, radar refractivity in the yes simulation. and and also yeah, radar, and, radar velocity okay and do you know uh, these uh, simulations use uh, uh, hydro media as control variables or radar refractivity as control variables in the simulation do you know that? Which one? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, 
I may need to confirm with that with uh, Ted Mansell, who who's really runs the microphysics side of things for us. Um, and I need to correct myself earlier. I forgot. Uh, the, the analysis uh, for WAFs is actually 36 members. So we use a 36-member ensemble to do the data simulation, but uh, just to save computational costs, we only issue an 18-member forecast. And uh, for radar reflectivity assimilation, we use it to update um, all the state variables, but that includes uh, the different hydrometeor mixing ratios. And we use the NSSL two-moment microphysics. And so we update, um, I, I think it's six species, and we update the number concentration for each of those six species, I believe. Uh, and we just let the ensemble common filter develop covariances and do the work for that. Thank you. So I, I may send you an email to ask for uh, more information about this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to pass along. Um, this this talk didn't lend itself to putting a lot of references in there, but I, I'm happy to pass along any any warm and forecast system references and, and anything else that I can Thank provide. Thank you. Uh, Brian, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Pat. Nice uh, presentation. Um, Hi, Brian. <laughs> Couple questions. Uh, one short question might be future work. Is I was intrigued by your her uh, results uh, and 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 I and the NSSL is also a wharf uh, sort of situation. So they're both kind of running wharf, and they were so different. So I know this might be future work. So I was curious: is that the assimilation or the physics? How similar are the NSSL physics to the her? They're very similar. Um, we work with DSL, and so we've, we've basically developed the WAPs from a starting point of the, the, the code base that they use for the HER. Uh, so there are variations. We use uh, multi-physics and, and PBL and radiation schemes, and we use NSSL2 moment, moment microphysics rather than Thompson. Um, but in general, you know, we're also using the, the HER ensemble for uh, initial and boundary conditions. So it's not unexpected that they would be very similar compared to the others. Um, but yeah, in terms of looking at relative to different dynamic cores, um, I know Bill Gallus is looking at this event as well, and he's looking at some FE3 runs and finding some differences between that and the WERF. And so it's just because it seems to be a very highly conditional uh, event, it, it may be a good opportunity to coax out how subtle differences in different modeling systems are able to provide big differences in the, the forecast evolution. My other question was, I mean, this is just maybe thinking longer term that, you know, the WAFs, this has been going on for a while and, and, and hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll become, you know, operational, so to speak, you know, with, in terms of the actual warning process and so forth. But, but I'm curious what the strategy is. You mentioned this is a very rare event um, and, and, you know, and a, but a very important event. So, how what's the plan to sort of uh, get enough cases and and data sets to you know really push this forward uh, you know to, to understand the probabilistic verification right you have to have x number of events to verify and and so is there a, is there a plan to archive x number of events and go through that process yeah and, and and we are in the process of doing it. This is a this is a special event where we've we've never run WAFs in this manner before. But given the the how interesting the actual event was, we thought it was worthwhile as a case study. Uh, in terms of the the actual one on forecast system, we run it. We've been running it about 50 cases a day during the spring and summer for uh, the past five years. So at this point, we have we have 205 cases that are archived, and that's run in a, a similar uh, configuration from year over year. And we're using that to assess its ability to predict uh, thunderstorms at different and, and mesocyclones at different time periods. And so we used a lot of object-based verification for that, um, which I think lends itself to the individual thunderstorm prediction. Um, and then in terms of some of the more standard uh, grid-based neighborhood verification, one thing we're, we're really looking at and, and is proving to be a difficult research project problem is, you know, we want to provide guidance for individual convective storms but we don't know what point we switch over from providing guidance for a specific storm to be providing more regional guidance. We know that, you know, WASP behaves similarly to other CAM ensembles prior to convection initiation, but 
After a storm's been up for an hour and you've been able to assimilate radar data, you're able to provide more specific information on the evolution of that storm. However, you know, at three hours and a given mesoscale background, then maybe you're able to provide similar uh, quality as you did in the, the first hour if it's a highly predictable, you know, MCS larger scale type event. But for something that's, you know, a supercellular marginal environment, then there's a lot more uncertainty. And so that's a transition from the WAF's idea of using it to actually issue warnings and something that's more to provide numerical weather prediction guidance that's in between the watch and the warning scale. So something that weather service offices and SBC can use to inform where the next warning may be. If SBC is going to issue something like the, the meso gamma discussions that they are now for specific storm elements, and this is something we think WAFs can be really useful for. Uh, but a lot of the work that we're doing right now is working with weather service and SBC and WPC forecasters to, to figure out sort of where is the wheelhouse for this guidance. They've all expressed that it is useful, but we have to do a lot of work to figure out what situations it's useful for and, you know, what is an appropriate way to interpret this guidance? You know, what is what are things that it can tell you and what are things that you should maybe take with a grain of salt? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, in terms of improving situational awareness, uh, at least starting with that. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, Pat, I think back to the original one on forecast paper that uh, was led by Dave Stensrud and that that graphic that everybody used for years and years uh, where you had the super cell and you could predict, well, there's a you know, 60%, 70%, 80% chance of it striking this particular location. Um, how has that original idea you know, changed with the realities of the past 10 years of research. Um, and what do you, what do you, I, I mean, we were chatting yesterday and, and you just mentioned this now, but um, the, the, the forecasters are, are, are into this, it seems like. They, they love the guidance. Um, but how do you see um, the kind of the initial vision of what Warnock Forecast was versus the reality of how you think it can actually uh, be useful for forecasters in the next 10 years? Yeah, that's a, a great question, and I, I touched it on a bit in the earlier answer, but this is something that, you know, because that graphic, which I actually didn't include in this talk, uh, for those who don't know, this is it, this is a figure from the original World Forecast article, which was published in 2009, and we've used it in like 90% of all World Forecast talks over the past decade, but it, it, it's an illustration where you just are trying to predict the path of a supercell with some sort of probability of a tornado occurring. And it still illustrates the concept of warn and forecast. But in reality, you know, it, it was done to say that we're going to predict tornadoes an hour and a half in advance. And, you know, we don't have the computing power to, to resolve tornadic circulations or even close. We can use machine learning uh, post-processing to come up with some kind of a calibrated likelihood of a tornado in warn and forecast storms. But it doesn't look the way that original vision does. And it, I'm actually going to go back. I mean, if you look at just the probability swath here on the left for WAFs, that's not unlike that figure from Stinsrud at all. However, it's just not a supercell. It's a, a two-state long MCS. But you are providing uh, this probabilistic swath of an impact over some period of time. And I think what we found is that, you know, the the period of time is a little bit flexible and it's dependent on a lot of aspects of just, you know, intrinsic and practical, practical predictability of convective storms, which has a lot of variation over time scales that are important to us. And the other one is that the application uh, in terms of uh, like from a social science perspective, should we even be issuing tornado warnings with two hours of lead time? And I think the, the answer to that has, has been shown to be no. And so, it becomes a question on what is the appropriate guidance to provide uh, during this period. If we don't want to tell people to go to their shelter an hour and a half before a tornado occurs, because that's just that's more time than they need. But if there's a large event venue, then we want to let them know that there's there's an increasing potential for a tornado in an hour and a half, and you might want to start taking precautions. So it allows us to provide uh, more customized, more specific information to different end users. And that also then complicates things because that means that we're going to have to develop different products uh, for different situations. And that's that, again, falls with uh, social science research that's being done at SSL, but also with uh, National Weather Service and uh, national centers. 
yeah, it's uh, it's 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 interesting to see just how um, how it's changed since 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 I was there, uh, uh, I guess seven years ago. Um, but uh, you know, I think it's I think it's a credit to the program that 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 you're that you're adapting uh, to those realities. Uh, okay, last question, uh, Ping, go ahead. Yes, hi. That's a, a very interesting talk. I have a question. What is there a tornado during that period of time? Uh, actually occurred. I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I think you you broke up for a second. Oh, I'm asking whether there was a tornado during that period of time. Yeah, um, there were 27 tornado reports. Um, I think it's likely there were actually more than that because a lot of tornadoes go unreported. Um, there's a, a group at SSL who actually took um, drones with with infrared cameras or specialized camera equipment. I don't know exactly what they were, but they would use it to go out and look for vegetation tracks or scouring and try to find tornado tracks that went unreported. And they found several in Iowa. And so there's there's two different periods of tornado development. One when the system, I'm gonna go back to the, the radar loop because it just makes it easier to describe. Um, When the system is very concentrated, uh, smaller scales, it goes through Western Iowa. There's a few tornado reports there associated with mesovortices along the leading edge of the Bow Echo. And then as it broadens and gets out into Illinois, it actually increases the number of tornado reports by quite a bit. Uh, you have lots of embedded circulations within the line and also within the bookend at the northern end of it. And those all are responsible for several tornado reports. Uh, one thing I've seen uh, National Weather Service forecasters done some research and looked at the changing environment ahead of the system and sound that they did see increasing low level storm relative felicity, uh, which may have been triggered from environmental modification from the system uh, as it grew into this really large mature system. And that may have assisted um, this increase in tornado development later on in its lifetime. So that's that's another future work thing. That's it's probably a whole nother study that would be interesting to look at. Yeah, so did the forecasting system catch any of those tornadoes? Oh. Um, it does. I didn't include any um, loops of it. Um, the skill of the tornado prediction is a lot smaller or lower than the severe wind simply because they're much smaller temporal and spatial footprints. Uh, but we use updraft telicity as a proxy for mesovortex uh, likelihood and then use that as a proxy for tornado likelihood. And it is able to uh, produce a lot of uh, updraft telicity tracks. They correspond with uh, um, sort of the preferred locations in a broad sense to the tornado development in Iowa. And then also it's a bit more spotty, but it's certainly advertising the potential for more uh, uh, widespread tornado development in Illinois as it becomes that, that larger bell echo. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Pat. That was a, a, a great talk. Uh, thanks for being here. I thank everyone else for being here. Um, and uh, I think we have we have one more Taos seminar that will be, I, I, I believe, uh, Wednesday after Thanksgiving. And that'll be it for the semester. So thanks everyone for being here today. Thank you, Pat. And uh, I will contact you offline so you and I can meet. Okay. All right. Well, so, thank you, everyone. I appreciate the, the opportunity. All right. Thanks, everybody.